Hello YouTube and welcome to this new video series on networking. We'll dive into the world of networking and the aim is not to go very deep into all of the details of what makes up a switch, what makes up a router or a firewall, etc. But to focus and do a little bit of an overview of the various components involved that make up a typical network and which considerations one should make to go for one type of device over another within a given category. In this particular video, we will be focusing on the category of network switches, the important means of distributing and connecting wired networking devices. If you want a more in-depth understanding of what a switch does, I can recommend that clicking on the link uh, in your top right corner of your screen, and uh, you'll see about a minute worth of overview of what a switch really does. Without further ado, let's get into the switching. Before we can get into the nitty gritty, there is two important terms that we will be talking about a couple of times in the course of this video. And those are VLANs and power over Ethernet. Let's go over VLANs first. A VLAN or a virtual LAN or virtual local area network is a virtual subnetwork that is used to separate traffic or in a more technical sense, uh, layer two broadcast domains. You can use a VLAN, for instance, to separate guest traffic. When you've got guests over to your house, you can give them their own little network that is completely separate from your main one, or another network for IoT devices, for instance, that you don't really trust with access to all of your devices because they phone home to some big tech company. All of these virtual networks can run over the same cable as your main network even, so you don't need to run extra cables for extra VLANs. A VLAN has two modes, untagged or tagged. A tagged VLAN is meant to pass through a VLAN from one device, such as a switch or an access point, to another. An untagged VLAN is meant for end-user devices, such as a computer, a phone, or a gaming console. The second term, power over Ethernet, is quite simple. It says it you know, right there on the tin. Power over Ethernet means you can power a device over an Ethernet cable directly. You don't need to run mains power to devices like that, and uh, it's especially useful for wireless access points because they're very low power. Usually they consume about five to 10 watts. Uh, and you don't really want to place them in places where there's a wall out, but just put it on somewhere on the ceiling, run an ethernet cable to it and you've got power. It's really just that simple. With all of these terms out of the way, let's really get into all of the various details and uh, which kind of switches we have. All right, so now the technical fun stuff begins. The most basic component in your network, besides networking cables, is the switch. A switch typically takes an input from one source, an ISP modem, a router, or another switch, which is known as an uplink, and distributes it to other ports available on that particular switch. For simplicity's sake, we're going to differentiate three main types of switches in this video. The dumb switch, which is a basic switch without any advanced features, is just garbage in, garbage out, the smart switch, which is really a more, uh, well, smarter solution, offers basic support for VLANs, and it has some management capabilities built in as well. And we have the Pro Enterprise switch, which has advanced management features, basic routing capabilities uh, in many of them, and they are aimed at the prosumer enterprise market. There's also something known as an Ethernet hub, but we'll skip over that as they're no longer commonly seen in modern networks, and they offer significant security weaknesses, as all ports on an Ethernet hub can be used to sniff all of the traffic passing through it. That means that um, if there's some bad traffic passing through your network and it passes through that particular hub, you can just connect your laptop to it, and you can sniff all of that traffic out, and you can see exactly what's going on. And uh, that's really not the way to go anymore in 2021. Let's talk about the dumb or unmanaged switch. This is the most common type of switch you'll find in a home or small business network. It splits the uplink signal to as many ports as the switch has. There is no trickery involved in terms of VLANs, routing or the like, just a basic device to connect a basic network of devices together. These devices are cheap, plentiful, usually quiet, and use very little power. If you've thought about your requirements for your network properly and found that you have no need for network segmentation, which can also be done by separating networks via router, or any management capabilities, this is the switch type to buy. It's perfect for home use to connect your gaming console, smart speakers, and a TV to a wired Ethernet network. 
Typical brands you'll find in this part of the market include TP-Link, Netgear, D-Link and Linksys. I'll put up some examples on the screen right now so you can see what we're talking about. As you can see, for a basic dumb switch model for simple home network, look at about 20 bucks for a 5 port model. 8 port models are usually about 5-10 bucks more. The next logical step in upgrading your network is a smart switch, or a managed switch. It's a very good option for that. It has the same basic features as the dumb switch and builds on top of that. Smart switches can be managed through an application, a phone app or a web browser and offer limited support for VLANs and even sometimes power over Ethernet. They're usually 10-20% to more expensive than the equivalent dumb switch, excluding PoE because those are typically about twice the price, but they use about the same amount of power. There's a couple of reasons to consider buying a smart switch over a dumb switch. First of all, you, you're ready, should you decide, to start implementing VLANs for better network security for only a small premium. Second of all, should you have routed IP television from your internet service provider, which is very common practice for internet providers of FTTH, also known as fiber to the home, you'll want switches with IGMP snooping support. Most, if not all, smart switches support this feature. Without it, it's very easy to get your switch overwhelmed by broadcast traffic or multicast traffic for the TV signal. And lastly, they make troubleshooting a bit easier. Through a dedicated IP address on the network, you can manage a smart switch and integrate it into a network monitoring solution. Even a simple heartbeat, like a ping, you can easily use that to diagnose which switch is down and causing the issues, and easily rectify it. In the space of smart switches slash managed switches, you usually find brands like TP-Link, Netgear, entry-level ubiquity switches, and Zyxel. In, uh, in some of these examples of these switches you can see here on the screen again. So you can get a picture of the uh, premium over a dumb switch. It's usually about 5 to 10 bucks uh, for a typical non-PoE managed switch over a dumb one. As I've stated before, the price delta is very small between a dumb and a smart switch and I personally recommend to get a smart switch whenever it's possible because it opens up a lot of possibilities to upgrade your network in the future. If you want to take it even one step further, you can go to the Pro or Enterprise switch. This category is something that most home users will rarely if never encounter due to the complexity in terms of setting them up, the cost, noise level and even power consumption where you're really stacking up those PoE ports. The Pro Switch is really geared towards businesses, enterprises, and uh, even these switches can be put into three main categories. You have the core switches, which are the backbone of an enterprise network. You have distribution switches, which distribute information from the core to the third category access switches, which provide connectivity for end devices like computers, servers, access points, printers, and so on. We're focusing on the access switch category in this particular video. The Pro Switch is designed from the ground up to be managed, usually remotely, and it assumes that you know something about networking. Uh, they're often equipped with a very powerful and complex web UI or basic command line access. That command line access is usually just found on switches that have a bigger emphasis on security, as the harder it is to change settings, the more secure the switch is. They are usually found with rack mount ears and come equipped with fans to cool down components on the board and the power supplies in case of very powerful PoE switches. Pro switches can cost up to thousands of dollars and have hundreds of watts of worth of PoE budget if you uh, get a really good one and are mainly designed for rack use, hence the noisy and powerful fans because they don't really make that much of a difference in a server environment. The Pro Switch market has many players such as Ubiquiti, HPE Aruba, Microtech, Arista, Cisco, Dell and many more. Some of the examples are shown on the screen again. It's easy to tell these switches are a very different kettle of fish, as they say, from the other kinds of switches we've talked about before. Now that we've talked about the different kinds of switches that there are, um, I want to go into a little bit of a tangent here uh, to just tell you about the things you should consider when you're going to build your network from the ground up. When designing your network, you'll need to consider when to use a switch and when to just run extra bundles of network cable whenever possible. The thing is that you shouldn't interconnect many switches together. 
Don't connect it, uh, your router or firewall to a switch, then connect that switch to another switch and so on and so forth. You should typically have a main switch that connects to your firewall or RSP modem and then run cables to that switch. Placement is very important. If you have a need for or no other option than running multiple switches connected to one another, consider how much bandwidth you'll need on your network, as that single connection between those switches will handle all of the traffic from the end devices on that switch all the way to the outside of your network. This can easily become a bottleneck when multiple devices on different switches want a full gigabit connection. Choosing a switch with uplink ports that support multi-gig, such as 2.5 gigabit, 5 gigabit, 10 gigabit Ethernet, will solve that issue, but you definitely need to buy a switch that can support that. Now, a good amount of the affordable Pro switches will have SFP Plus module support, which will allow up to 10, gigabyte, or 10 gigabit connections. You can use those to interconnect the other switches, and have a 10 gig uh, backhaul. And uh, typically, if you look for secondhand on eBay or other sources, you can find the SFP Plus modules for pretty low prices, sometimes like 10, 20 bucks each. And the fiber cables that you need for them aren't typically that expensive either. So it's a good thing to consider. You can even opt for SFP Plus to RJ45 and uh, use regular network cables there. CAT6 or CAT6A for 10 gig is plenty. If you're going to use CAT6, keep in mind that you need to uh, ideally keep the cable short, as in uh, usually less than 50 meters for best operation. CAT5E is good enough for up to 5 gig E with good quality cables. And with that, this is the end of the video. This concludes my overview of the various types of switches and which type fits which use case. If you want, we can take this format up to routing as well as some basic firewalling in the future. I hope this video has been informative and I thank you all for watching.